Um, anyway, look, good evening, everyone. Um, the unmistakable sounds there of Vaughan Williams, Symphonia Antarctica. And uh, this evening, we gather to fill in the historical background to Captain Scott's 1910-13 uh, Terra Nova expedition, Terra Nova, the name of the ship. Uh, and then we look at how it came to inspire the film Scott of the Antarctic uh, and, of course, Vaughan Williams' music for it. Um, apologies for this rescheduling. I am just about fit again now. I'm sorry that we had to postpone in December. Um, I coughed for weeks. Um, it's funny, isn't it, when you recover and you start talking to people around the village, they tell you of all the other people who had exactly the same thing. It wasn't COVID, but it went on and on and on. But I'm so sorry for the rescheduling. Of course, it means some people are able to come tonight who couldn't previously and uh, vice versa. Um, the classiest apology for absence this evening, quite definitely, has come from somebody who's not able to be with us because they're travelling in South Georgia. <laughs> I mean, how's that for an excuse? I mean, that's not bad, is it? Um, I did have an email from somebody asking, uh, a UK-based person, he said, um, if it snows on Monday evening, will the Zoom event still go ahead? He thought that was funny. So I wrote back saying that's a frozen waste of a joke opportunity. But anyway, that turned into a very interesting uh, situation when Eric Saylor, who will wave at, at you now, uh, sent me an email on Saturday morning to say that he was in Arizona, but trying to get back to Des Moines in Iowa, which is his base, and the airport was closed because of snow. Um, it's sort of a bittersweet thing, that. It's sort of mildly humorous, and yet we very much feel for you, Eric, and I do hope you actually manage to get home again soon. Is there any prospect of getting back in the next few days? Uh, allegedly tomorrow, we'll find yeah. out. We are supposed to finally get temperatures in Iowa that will go above zero degrees Fahrenheit for the first time in about three or four days tomorrow, so... Fingers crossed in a in a sort of nice parallel. I did find out that my uh, the suburb I live in, Urbandale, was actually colder uh, two nights ago than the Amundsen uh, Scott Polar Research Station uh, at the South Pole was. Beat it by two degrees, but still, I don't know if that's a record I'd really be super keen on chasing, to be quite honest. Well, Eric, it's... it's appropriate that you've as it were beaten the snow odds if i can put it like that we've we've defeated the uh the snow situation in the united states it's good to have you with us eric sailor one of four guests this evening uh vaughan williams latest uh, biographer also with us is sarah heiress of the scott polar research uh, institute to fill us in on the narrative of scott's fateful 1910 13 expedition we also welcome a major contributor to the writing on Scott and Strathy. We'll talk about the work of the expedition's photographer, uh, Herb Ponting. And then uh, Kirsten Barker joins us from Illinois, where it's also pretty cold, I think, uh, Kirsten. Um, uh, and she's going to be talking about the music, in particular, about the music uh, that uh, Peter Maxwell Davies wrote in more recent times to describe uh, the Antarctic landscape and, and atmosphere. So that's what we've got uh, uh, successively as, as the evening develops. But uh, Sarah, if I can start with you, Sarah, who's uh, um, an Institute Associate at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. She's written extensively on the Captain Scott Terra Nova story. Two years ago, she published volume one of her graphic novel, not completely sure what a graphic novel is, but you may explain in the course of this. And that was called The Worst Journey in the World, inspired by aptly Cher Cherry Garrard's book of that name, the famous book, his account of taking part in the Terra Nova expedition. And Sarah also designed the Bringing the Worst Journey in the World to Life exhibit for the uh, Polar Museum at the Scott Polar Research Institute. And she's also worked for the U.S. Antarctic Programme as artist and writer. Well, look, as we get going, uh, Sarah, let's just get an image of Scott on the screen. 
There we go. What sort of character was he, Sarah? Oh, well, he was a rather complicated person, actually. Um, he had been sort of channeled into the Navy as a boy uh, by his father, and he probably would have been much happier as a scientist or a writer um, allowed to follow his passions, but he was very rigorously trained into being a, a naval officer. And so he walked the line of balancing the two of those through his adult career. Yeah. So there'd been this previous expedition that mm -hmm. uh, he had undertaken with the discovery. Um, what were the aims there of that expedition uh, perhaps in contrast to what Terranova did. Yeah, the, the discovery, and as much as it had aims, um, it was largely just go go to the Antarctic with a boat full of scientists and see what you can see. Um, they had a, a wide range of disciplines represented on the discovery, and they did a lot of the foundational work in practically every discipline that's done in Antarctica now. In fact, when I was down there, I talked to a marine biologist who was rather resentful of the discovery expedition because they had described most of the species in McMurdo Sound and hadn't left anything for her to discover. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So you, you mentioned there that he might have been a scientist. Um, um, that was an interest. Um, so, so, so what was the ultimate aim of the Terra Nova expedition. I mean, how important was the drive to get to the pole as opposed to the scientific work? The pole was definitely the uh, the big PR goal of the expedition. That's how they got people interested in it. Um, that's how Scott sold it to uh, its backers and to the Navy and to the general public. Um, was we're, we're going to claim the pole for Britain. Um, Britain had tried claiming it two years previously and failed. And he's like, oh, that's it. We're, we're going to do it this time. It's ours. Um, and it, he definitely pushes the pole aspect in, in all the public facing um, materials, uh, publicity materials. But um, he, as far as his own personal feelings go, if you read his personal writing, he's much more excited about the science. Um, he's very enthusiastic about bringing, bringing together a really good scientific team um, about all the stuff that they're going to, to explore and discover. Um, the Discovery Expedition had the, the one great disappointment of the Discovery was the meteorological record. And he was determined that the, he was going to fix that the second time around. And he got a, a very well-respected meteorologist to, to do it properly this time. So his own record of the Terra Nova expedition, his own writings, make make clear, do they, that the science was really important to him? It was, yes, it was definitely, there are very few references to, oh boy, won't it be great when I get the poll, and a lot of references to, isn't this science so terribly exciting? In fact, he wrote, science, the rock foundation of all effort, and with exclamation marks, he was very, very enthusiastic about the science. Well, we ought to have a look at the Terra Nova. I can't remember where I actually found this, but um, here's the Terra Nova actually in the Thames heading off. We can see a crowd there to the right and um, tugboat shepherding it out. London, of course, uh, the most significant port in the world at that time. Um, a little bit of colour on this. Not sure just how accurate the colours are, but very fine thing. I wouldn't mind that on my mantelpiece. I wonder how big that actually is. I suppose it's bound to be fairly big with a plimsoll line. And then um, I found this, Sarah, um, and I'm not quite sure where this picture was actually taken, but it looks as if, OK, we've got, <clears throat> we've got horses and we've got dogs on the right. Uh, presumably right. they didn't take those with them all the way. Is that? I think the story that's told in the script around is that they picked some of the animals up along the way. No, well, they, yes, they didn't take them from London. Um, they had a man go out to Siberia and, and choose the dogs and horses. And then they met, they, he took the animals down to New Zealand and they met him in New Zealand and picked up the animals there rather than ship them all the way from Britain. It is a hugely expensive operation, this, Sarah. Yes. I mean, I don't know what the, the figures are, but it's obviously it's in, in the millions of of, of pounds today, many millions of pounds today. I mean, how did you go about raising money uh, for this sort of thing? 
he actually crowdfunded it to a great degree. Um, there was there were uh, sponsorships, corporate sponsorships, as we know them now, where um, companies would donate clothing and equipment and food and so on in return for product placement in the expedition photographs. So you'll see in, in lots of photographs of the base hut very prominently Coleman's mustard and so on because they donated a, a great deal of, uh, of equipment to the expedition. Um, they uh, got a lot of support from, for example, um, the expedition's official home port was Cardiff and uh, they got a lot of support from the coal merchants in Cardiff. So the, they loaded up the ship with coal um, when they left from Cardiff for free. Uh, the same in um, in New Zealand, they got a whole bunch of coal from people who just wanted to wish them well. Um, all the all the woolly the the grey woolly jumpers were a donation from some sheep farm near Dunedin um, in New Zealand. It was there was a lot of goodwill towards the expedition and a lot of donations in kind. And then the public subscriptions. Um, there were organized ones where you could you could like as a as a primary school you could all get together and chip in sixpence for you know, helping to, to go towards a dog purchase or, or buying a sledge or something like that. Um, um, so two, it's two all very carefully noted down, sorry? Yeah, oh, but a couple of things. I mean, I, did they, I can't remember if you actually said it there, but was all the money covered by the time they left London? No, the expedition was, was very much in debt. Um, the, a lot of it was going to be earned back by, because Scott, it, it was a private expedition as opposed to the discovery, which was, a government um, official national expedition. The Terra Nova was, was a private expedition on Scott's part. And he had bought the ship as his own personal ship. He bought it from uh, the seal trade in Canada. And he was going to make a lot of money back by selling the ship back to them. That was the deal, is that he would buy it off them for a couple of years and then they'd buy it back off him and the money would come back. Um, but there was also a lot of money to be made in speaking engagements and publication deals and, and so on. So they were going to recoup some money when they got back yeah, um, yeah. and pay off the expedition debts. So presumably, if you're leaving in debt, you've got to make jolly sure that there are regular reports in, in the press back home so that you keep on stirring the pot, I would guess, yes? Well, yes, but that was the capacity for doing that was fairly limited because the relief ship only came once a year and it would only bring one parcel of news back with it. So he did send an update when the ship went back in uh, early 1912. He sent an update as like, here's what we've been up to for the last year. And now we're all striving off for the pole as you're reading this. Um, but uh, after that, the next update was, oh, surprise, everyone's dead. Yeah. So, so um We've, we've, we've established the, the importance of the science to, to Scott. So at what point does getting to the South Pole become the big thing? Well, it, it was always going to be the, um, I suppose, the, the, the central focus of the expedition, because that's what everyone was supporting, was this effort to get to the South Pole. Um, and so when they first landed, their, their number one order of business was to set up the hut. But as soon as the hut was on its way to completion, um, a party set, set off to lay depots for the following summer's attempt at the pole. They didn't have enough time. They knew they wouldn't have enough time to go all the way to the pole and back the first summer that they arrived. Um, but what they could do was take a whole lot of food and fuel and spare equipment out onto the ice um, and lay it in depots along the route that they were going to take to the pole so that the following summer, they wouldn't have to haul all of it from the base camp. They could pick it up along the way and save themselves some weight. So that's what they did the first year. And then over the winter, uh, well, that's what some people did. Uh, scientists were doing their thing. Um, and then over the winter, those who could do their science over the winter were doing it. Those who were working up results from the previous summer were doing that. They were doing lectures and training the animals and, and so on. Um, and then the, the following spring, uh, at the end of October, beginning of November, then they set out um, on the polar journey. And that was the, the main focus of the, the larger number of people um, in that, that full, the first full summer they were there was the polar journey. But there were also people who stayed at the base camp to, to do their various scientific programs. The geologists went off to the mountains because the polar journey was mostly over ice. There was nothing for the geologists to do. So they went and did their thing. Um, 
through this whole time, there was a little splinter party that was in a completely different part of Antarctica pursuing their own scientific program. So people were doing things that weren't the pole, but the, the central organizing force was dedicated to the polar journey. Let's have a look at one or two photographs from base, base camp at these next two very, very well-known images there. Scott uh, writing in his journal, diary, socks hanging on the wall, we like that, and pictures from home. Um, this is one of my favourite photographs ever. I don't know why, but there's something about this photograph that I just go back to again and again. Um, and this was Christmas Day, was it? Or it was midwinter. Midwinter, that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's Scott at, at the end there, and um, tucking in. My goodness, they, mm -hmm. they were well provided for, and at least two bottles of wine on there. And then oh, we they, they were given many crates of champagne. Um, one of the uh, one of the scientists commented that one could get quite sick of champagne on the Terra Nova expedition and uh, wish for something a little more. There you are. So here's here's the, the the band of brothers outside the hut, and that's a colorized picture, presumably, is it? Because there there were a few autochromes taken. Um, we might a few, but not of people, as far as I know. Yeah, that, that's yeah. been that's been colored now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Anne, uh, uh, just while we're dealing with that, uh, uh, um, th there are some colour pictures, autochromes, aren't there, of, of the journey? It's not like that. If they don't look like that. It's a colourised plate, which lets you do, and Ponting used it to do things like sunsets and things yeah. like that. That That is a colourised black and white photo by somebody who's done it recently. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, the, uh, Sarah, the awareness of the Amundsen expedition, at what point does Scott realise, oops, there actually is a race on him? Uh, that would be when he arrives in Melbourne and gets a, a telegram from Amundsen. Amundsen actually left Norway on the... Um, putting forth to the world that he was going to the North Pole, even to his own crew, even to the men on his ship, he said... We're off to the North Pole. Um, it wasn't until they arrived at Madeira that he said, surprise, we're actually going to the South Pole. Anyone who doesn't want to go to the South Pole, get off the ship now. And they all stayed on the ship and went with him to Antarctica. But at that point, actually, it was his brother who sent an, e uh, an email, <laughs> a telegram <laughs> to Scott um, for, for him to receive when he arrived in Melbourne. And uh, Scott was not very enthusiastic about this. He did not want to race. Uh, this was a race that was thrust upon him. And he knew because of the way the press is that everyone was going to decide this was a race now. And that was not at all what he had planned this expedition to be. Yeah. So how many men make the, the final attempt on the pole in Scott's group? So of, of the shore party, so that's what this photo is here, is the shore party at Cape Evans. Um, you had uh, four men set out with the motor sledges. Um, they set out early uh, just to see what would, but they were an experimental um, mechanized transport and they didn't know what they would do. So they set a, a couple weeks early just to see what they might achieve. Um, then 10 men left with ponies, each had a pony. And then the dog teams with two men set off a, a week or so after them. Um, so that was 16 total. Uh, after they reached, um, well, the, the, the motors broke down fairly quickly. Uh, the people who were hauling the motors then became man haulers and they hauled their sledge down to about 82 degrees south. Um, the dogs were supposed to have been sent back from 82 degrees south, but Scott decided to take them on because they were doing better than expected. Um, they So two men went back from the motor party from there. Um, and then the rest of the party headed south towards the bottom of the Beardmore Glacier. Uh, they shot the ponies, well, they shot the ponies along the way to feed the dogs. And then the, the ponies that hadn't been shot by the time they got to the glacier, they, they knew that they would never get them up the glacier. So they, they shot them and depoted them for meat there. Um, and then the dog teams went back with two men, which left 10 to go the rest of the way. Um, that it was organized into three parties of four men um, it was never going to be all 10 of them going to the pole. It was the idea was they would all haul as many supplies as they could. And then one party would turn back, 
leave a depot and then turn back with all just what they needed to get home. And then, um, so that was at the top of the Beardmore, the first party turned back, but uh, halfway between the, the top of the Beardmore and the pole, the second party turned back, did the same, left a depot, headed home just with what they needed, um, which left uh, five men, this is possibly Scott's greatest mistake, was taking five men to the pole rather than four as originally planned. Um, there are reasons that he might have done that, but it ended up being a bad idea. Um, and, and so then the five men went to the pole and uh, and the idea was on their way back, they could travel fast and light, just picking up the food they needed from the depots, not having to haul it, you know, all the way. And, um, then, and these, de the these depots are marked with black flags, was that right? They're the black flag depots, are they? Is that how they were marked? Uh, you know what? I don't actually remember if they were black or red. I know that the the they had a flag and that the fuel cans were bright red and they would put the fuel cans on top of the depot to be extra visibility. Yeah. Um, and that was another problem because they caught the sunlight and leaked and, uh, you know. Because there's, there's um, a track in the film music that is 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 actually uh, dis, uh, given the title, The Black Flag, which I, so I presume that. Oh, but that's, that's a specific flag though. That is Amundsen's flag. That is when they realize ah. they've been beaten to the pole is when they see a flag that they did not set. And right. as I like, oh, that has to be the Norwegians. There we go. There we go. So look, here's the fateful photograph, Sarah. You said five. Here they are. They're not smiling, are they? What What does this picture represent? This is, um, they arrived at the pole on the 17th of January, 1912. They took their photos on the 18th of January. So they got there. They said, okay, we've been beaten fair and square. Um, they took a photo of themselves at uh, Amundsen's tent just to prove that Amundsen had got there first. Um, and then they took they, a few a few hundred meters away, they took their group photos. There are actually a, a collection of group photos with people in different configurations. And there is one in which they're laughing. You never see that one. Yeah, well, I suppose that's that's that, that's natural. Um, so we we basically know that this, the, the story of how the tragedy unfolds from, from, from that point. And I just wonder if if the tragedy that we're so familiar with has actually overshadowed the real achievements of the overall Terra Nova expedition. We think of this as a failure and it's the ill-fated expedition, but mm -hmm. was it ultimately overall a success, the Terra Nova project? I think if you, if you weighed up everything equally, yes. Um, Scott said when he was originally laying out his plans, his specific plans for the expedition over the, over the first winter, he said to his scientists, this whole expedition, like we all, we're all here doing science. We love science, but this whole expedition is going to be judged on our success or not in reaching the pole. That's how public opinion is going to remember us. So, um, so he was very aware that the just getting to the pole and whether or not he claimed it for Britain, but um, getting there was was the important thing. Of course, one would assume also getting home again. But <laughs> it is important to remember that they did do what they set out to do, which was to reach the pole. They just didn't get home yeah. again. Yeah. Um, scientifically, it was a roaring success. They they gathered tons of, of data. They're, they're, the data they gathered on um, on ice formations and uh, zoology and meteorology and all, all these things. These are the baseline that we use for a lot of Antarctic science now. Um, in fact, even things like uh, they use specimens collected on the Terra Nova expedition to prove that DDT had reached Antarctica in the 80s. Um, and that's thanks to the scientific program of the Terra Nova expedition. But we don't remember because we think, oh, the dying death, sad. Yeah. Well, um, I managed to find this um an advert for a queen's hall concert henry wood conducted the queen's hall orchestra a uh, funeral march from erica uh, in memoriam captain scott i mean how long did news of of the deaths actually take to reach home sorry i missed some of that question uh, how, how, long, how did... long did it take for for news of the, the oh for news to, yeah yeah um, the search party found the Polar Party and all their records in November of 1912, but it wasn't until February of 1913 that everyone got back to New Zealand and the news reached the world. So the, the telegram was sent from Omaru on, the, I believe, the 10th of February. And so news would have reached London within hours. 
um, I believe the memorial service at St. Paul's was on the 14th of mm. February. Um, and, well, you know, it was, this, it was this a, concert. Yes, this concert was very yeah, it was, to that. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a huge blow to the national psyche because everyone was really invested in this. Um, and it uh, it was this it was it kind of prefigured the um, the mass grief of World War One. Uh, it was it was, you know, how, you know, our glorious dead and and the whole nation, um, you know, it was it was by the time the news reached Britain, it was uh, almost a year since the Titanic. So you'd already had that disaster um, playing on on in the culture, and then you get this. You know, our our brave heroes died in the course of their heroic adventure, and they they were steadfast to the end and upheld British values. And aren't we so proud of them? But isn't it also so dreadful that they died? Um, and and that that tremendous outpouring of of emotion um, was, I mean, for a very repressed uh, culture, <laughs> it was probably rather cathartic, um, but it was also something that could bring people together. And um, it was it was kind of unifying in a way. And uh, um, it it reinforced a culture's picture of itself as, um, you know, resolute and honorable and all, all the best ideas of Britishness are embodied in the polar party. So even though they, they died and that was tragic, it was it was a heroic tragedy. Well, as you see there, um, Captain Scott gets his model at Madame Two Swords very soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was there before that. I don't know. But anyway, I found I found that um, things did come back here for. Uh, um, uh, well, they were certainly back. Maybe they were back here already. But there was an exhibition uh, um, that um, highlighted the whole expedition, I think, at the Maritime Museum several years ago. And there's just one or two exhibits here. Uh, the scale of that, Sarah, what would that be? Do you happen to know what, what sort of egg that is? Because I couldn't That's see. That's an emperor penguin egg. Right. right. It's, um, this This might be my cultural bias. Showing. It's about the same size as a Canada goose egg. <laughs> if, yeah. if you've ever seen a Canada goose egg, that's, yeah, it's like, eh. Right. And then some goggles found the way back. And um, I was trying to work out exactly how these worked, Sarah. I don't know if you know. They... Those, yes, those are ski shoes. Um, they so in order to use your ski properly, you have to have hard soled shoes that clip it into some some metal braces on the side of the ski. Um, the trouble was if it uh, the footwear that the expedition took um, was based on Sami. Uh, like northern indigenous Scandinavian footwear, which were these loose fur boots, which allowed circulation in your feet. Um, they allowed your feet to flex while you were like, unlike a, a stiff leather boot, they they allowed your feet to stay a lot warmer. They were terrible to wear on rock, but most of the expedition was over ice and snow. And so they would they would always wear, they, they were called finisco, these fur boots. But you can't wear finisco with ski um, because they're soft. And so those were an invention by uh, Edgar Evans, who was one of the five who went to the pole. Scott said, Mr. Evans, we need to be able to wear our finisco with our ski. Can you make this happen? And he invented this, this ski shoe that you could put on over your finisco so you could wear your lovely, warm, comfy finisco on your ski, but still have the benefits of the hard sole um, for, for hooking up to your ski. Well, look, Sarah, that's been a, a magical introduction uh, to the, the expedition, okay, in in brief, but that's taken us inside what what happened uh, to that fateful e e expedition, um, and maybe we'll hear from you again in due course as as we proceed. Uh, but Anne Strathy, now I welcome you. If you want to actually get your screen shared, Anne, before we can continue, um, Anne has written extensively uh, about. Scott and uh, about the Terra Nova expedition. I think it's four books so far that uh, you've you've written, uh, or, or at least one of them is actually still in the pipeline. I think Anne, um, and the research for all her interest in in the subject has taken her right round the world to uh, various establishments where she's done her research. 
And I gather, Andy, you were first smitten by the Scott story when you you actually happened to move to Cheltenham, where you still live, um, about three years, uh, three decades ago. And you happened to regularly pass a statue of Edward Wilson, who died on the Terra Nova expedition. Yes, I I moved to Cheltenham quite a while ago, and then I worked laterally um, at the um, the Cheltenham Art Gallery Museum, where they had a big collection. And I started writing books after I left there. Um, I wrote about Birdie Bowers, who's one of the people you saw in the five at the pole. And then I've written two other books, including the one about Ponting. Um, yeah. So, well, indeed, it's Herbert one. Ponting. Herbert Ponting is is our focus now. Um, extraordinary photographs, which we'll be sampling as we go through this. Um, so he's well known for the still photographs and also a silent film about the expedition, but uh, there was more than just a, a silent film, wasn't there? Yes, I mean, you can see from these three, th th these are the BFI versions of them, but he did, we'll, we'll go back later on to explain how he got from what he took in Antarctica to the full length films, but he did, two full-length films, one of which was called The Great White Silence, which came out in 1924. It's a full-length film, but it's silent with intertitles. He then, in 1933, and this is where the link with Vaughan Williams comes, he did one called 90 Degrees South, and there's a soundtrack by Walford Davis who may ring a bell with some people who know about Vaughan Williams. And he was, the year after the film came out, Walford Davis became master of the King's music. Um, and another guy called Billy Tritel, who was actually known as a film composer. Um, and then the musicians may well have been musicians who also worked for the BBC. Um, which we'll, we we can talk about. Well, so uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, sorry, if I can just finish that. Uh, the one on the right, which is Scott of the Antarctica, which is where the link with Ron Williamkin is in. Um, we can talk at the end about how Ponting contributed to that, but there are definitely links between the three. Um, so tell us a little bit about Ponting. Um, um, he, he didn't set out to be a photographer at all, did he? No, um, Ponting came from, you may recognise the picture at the top, which is um, that is Salisbury. And he was born within the sound of the cathedral bells. And he, his father was a banker. Ponting lived in Salisbury for seven years. But then his father, who is a very get up and go banker, um, in very dynamic days for banking, um, started moving around for job after job. So Ponting endlessly changed school. Um, he was then persuaded, aged 18, to follow in father's footsteps, which um, obviously something that Robert Scott um, suffered from potentially. But um, he worked in a bank for a while, for about four years in Liverpool, and it was Liverpool that changed his life, really. He um, became a banker, but he also joined a photographic club. And in Liverpool, there was the very big art gallery there. There was also, in the art gallery, there were two huge international photograph exhibitions, which were a who's who of photography. And I found a little advert in the press of him buying and selling cameras. So it looks as if he had more than one camera at a time at that point. So he's already experiment. And in his bank, his bank was very near the waterfront in Liverpool. And I think he would have, they would have had people coming in the whole time with letters of exchange just back from New York. And I think somehow doing the ledgers didn't terribly appeal to Ponting. Um, so he um, decided to go west to California. Hmm. And, oops, that's the wrong one, sorry. Right. So um, 
this is some of the things in California. Initially, he rattled through several careers between 1893 and 1900. He was, uh, he started as a fruit grower because his father had bought a farm for him to, to, to um, a ranch. He did fruit farming. He was also interested in mining and he was also interested in gold panning and he was photographing everything. He was climbing Yosemite. He was going up to Lake Tahoe um, with chums in a place called Auburn, about a hundred miles north of San Francisco. He joined a photographic club, all that sort of thing. Um, he bumped into somebody in 1900 and they said, oh, your photos are very good. You should send them in. And he did them to all the things that you can see on the um, on the right, the list I put, he was sent in stereo views. He would send them in for illustrations to magazines. The picture um, on the left is of him diving into the sea at Sausalito, where he lived at one point. And where his hands are forward, you may just be able to see um, a stick, and that's him pulling the the shutter lever with a piece of string attached. So he's be he is becoming a, a fully-fledged professor. He's becoming a fully-fledged. He also put his um, photographs in for exhibitions, what they called photographic salon. And the photograph in the middle, um, which he took of um, its mules being trained to join the box, to, to serve, mules being trained to serve with the German army during the Boxer Rebellion in China. And somebody, when he put that into an exhibition, somebody said he's got a knack for it. He's got an eye for a photograph, but he's also got a knack of being there at the right time. So how on earth does he become involved with the Terra Nova expedition? That's what we want to right. know. OK. Um, oops. Firstly, he goes to work in Japan. Um, and he you can see there he's that's him climbing Mount Fuji. Um, and you can see in the right, he's there when a volcano explodes. He is becomes a travel photographer, what we would call a travel photographer. And he goes to Japan, the Philippines, Hong Kong, China, Korea, Indonesia, India, Burma, Ceylon. And when he's there, um, before he goes to India, he meets a man who has just been involved in the Russia-Japanese war, for which Ponting was a war correspondent. And... This guy, Cecil Mears, um, he is um, going back to Britain via the China-Tibet border. Um, and he's when he's back in Britain, they agree to meet up. But what he wants to do is go on a polar expedition. So when he, um, Hunting goes back to Britain in 1907, before Mears has got back, and he... Um, builds up another career. As you can see from the picture on the left, Madam Butterfly is all the rage and Gilbert and Sullivan is all the rage. Um, so his photos of geishas are very popular. Middle picture is the kind of thing that a magazine would have done with this picture. And then on the right, he goes photographing around Europe and that's the Matterhorn. And again, he's climbing mountains. Um, so he has become by 1909, by which point Scott is recruiting, he's become a pretty famous photographer. If, you know, if somebody said, who should I go to? Um, he would be one of the people on the list. So, so would there have been much competition to head off for goodness knows how long? Oh, there were probably- In the Antarctic. Yeah, I mean, the, the number of applications they were getting for all the jobs in the expedition ran to the hundreds. I mean- right. For a photographer, that would have been the equivalent of getting photographing their own wedding or something like that. It would have been a big career enhancing move, but it didn't pay very much. Well, you say it didn't pay very much. So what sort of kit does Ponting actually take with him to, the, to when, a whole range of kit? Well, the key, I mean, he takes crates of kit. He takes plate photographers, plate cameras. He takes small cameras that men can use when they're sledging. He takes um, roll film. He takes 
what they call um, photo packs, which is in between roll film and glass plates. And every camera has got its trade off as to whether how robust it is or how easy it is to use and things. But um, the key ones are one of them, which is uh, you can see there on the left is he takes two movie cameras. Ponting, however, has never used a movie camera before. Ah. So the man on the left is a man called Arthur Newman, who will come up later. Um, and Arthur Newman is a camera designer, and his cameras have previously been to Antarctica. Ponting's a quick learner. He's a good teacher. Um, in between, it's worth mentioning, is that the two pictures on to the right Ponting is writing a memoir of his book in Japan, of his time in Japan, which again, he's becoming more famous. And he's also taking part in the Japanese um, British exhibition. Mm. So he does not go south immediately with the um, the exhibition, the expedition. So, so once, once he's down um, in Antarctica, uh, yeah. was he given a specific brief for the sort of pictures he, he should take, or did he just basically use his imagination? I mean, how well, did he... I'll go on in a minute and show you a selection of what he did. But the key thing is, as Sarah mentioned, to do with the money, is that they do want photographs to get back, not just reports. Photographs have got to get back because newspapers have paid them good money to run photographs. And you're just beginning to get it's a critical time. You're just beginning to get magazines, but not newspapers, being able to publish photographs because of printing technology. Newspapers can't do it because they don't have fast enough printing presses. They are slow enough, they, they, they need faster pr printing presses. But on the way down, Ponting is taking photos like the one on the left of the Terra Nova st struck in ice. Um, on the classic right, picture. Yeah. yeah, and the one on the right is very is classic as well. That's an ice grotto. Yeah. What's important from the filming point of view is that is Ponting strung out over the side of the ship. So you just love that. That's just amazing. Filming um, the Terra Nova, the bow of the Terra Nova crashing through the ice. Yeah. So. Um, but then I'll just go through quickly the range of photographs he takes. Um, that's him on the right with his um, telephoto lens. Below, I'll, I'll go around clockwise. Um, that's his photo laboratory. That's him in on the left is him developing films and picking up on what Sarah said. That was sent back to Borough Welcomes to use as an advertisement because he's they're using their fluids, which they've donated, they're developing fluid. But to give you an idea how tough it was, um, that is Ponting lugging 200 pounds of photograph equipment across the ice. And occasionally the sledge went through the ice. So he's pretty tough. I mean, there's one time it's either him, the sledge, or both going through the ice, but he manages to um save the day and but, but I, I, I love the idea that he's got he's got a fully equipped studio as well as as, as oh well yeah, yeah. As and there's one on board there's one on board ship as well that's just extraordinary um for, i mean that for, for, photography you had a lab effectively like the scientists you had a laboratory ponting's room is the same size as the, the scientist lab and then he is also taking photographs which are very dramatic. And I've called that one photographer many demands. He is trying to take still photographs, stereo views, films that have got to go back to Gullment, not Gullment, Gullment, Gullment. There are photographs which are scientific. And they've got to go into expedition reports. There are lantern slides for Scott and people to use at, at uh, lectures. There's potentially exhibitions after things. So perhaps the one on the right, very dramatic shot. Um, men, including Ponting after two years, were allowed to um, write memoirs. So they're taking them for that. And then he um, he's also thinking of his future career. He's also writing 
in the same way as Scott is, a narrative of the expedition from beginning to end. Um, he's giving lectures, he's taking photographs. You can see in the bottom left, Edward Wilson doing paintings. Um, on the other side of the one of Ponton giving the lecture, um, that Cecil Mears, after he's come back from the barrier, um, the, the, the ice shelf, on the way, having come back from taking them partly the way to the South Pole. So he's making portraits. The next one to that is him doing wildlife, and there's films of that as well. Moving up, that's really important because that is him teaching Scott to take photographs properly, because when they go to the South Pole, it will be Scott and Birdie Bowers taking photographs. And then there's an arty shot of Mears and um, Oates over very Rembrandt over a, a stove, and then you've got the one of all the men. But well, all uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, Anne. I mean, we we don't know what photographs were discarded, but I mean, I've got a whole book of Ponting's photographs on the yeah. Ponting. Yeah, and well, these it, are some it gives, of the, it, the it gives the impression he was a, he really was a very fine photographer. He had a great eye for a shot. He called himself a camera artist, and. Yeah. So those ones on the left of the ice are both scientific records, but they're also very modernist looking shots. And there's your autochrome in the middle and the front, but having passed through the tropics twice on the way to get there, they weren't very good. He's using flashlight in that top one, and then he's got very minimal photos like the one on the right. So yeah, so that's a selection of what he was Terrific. doing. Terrific. Um but he, he he actually returns well before Scott actually heads off to make his assault on the South Pole. Why does he come back to England? He comes back to England because, partly because he can't go to the pole because of the weight of his equipment, um, but also because, as Sarah said, they need more money. And one of the good ways of raising money is to get lots of articles in the newspapers and magazines that will get people interested in it. And also to show um, the films at the, um, it's not cinema, it's a play. I'll go on to the next picture actually. Um, so, it's, so it's all part of a grand strategy. It's all part of a grand strategy. He's also preparing for Scott to return. He's preparing lantern slides. But on the left there is a programme from English National Opera, uh, the Coliseum. And that's where they did what they call mixed bills. So you've got Sarah Brent, uh, Bernhardt and Mr. Albert Schwally, a singer. I don't, don't know if he's re related to Maurice. But um, you've also got film clips from the expedition. And as you'll see below, um, product placement is not a new thing. Well, That's the used for the motor sledges. So Ponting is back and he is getting all ready for Scott. He goes to Switzerland for a break over Christmas New Year. And then suddenly he hears that they've died. So everything changes for him. Everything changes for him. Right. How, how, how does it change things for him? Well, his photos are no longer his property. Well, the, the, the exhibition expedition had the copyright in them for two years anyway. But Ponty cannot be seen in those in that situation to be enhancing his career anymore. They are public property. They're like photos of Princess Diana after she dies. You know, it's it the whole thing changes. And he is now at the behest of the expedition committee. Um, what, some of the most famous photos, of course, are not taken by him. The one at the pole, but in that version of it, you can see Birdie Bowers <coughs> is actually pulling the string um, of the camera, which so the all five of them can be in there. So um, what um, Ponting, there's a whole period of sort of national mourning and so on, but by January 1914, they've published the expedition report, they've had the exhibition, the exhibition is now touring, and Ponting is allowed to give what he called 
our cinema lectures and that's where we come into the direct line to Scott of the Antarctic film. So we can talk. And, and he, he goes all over. He goes all over the place doing these cinema lectures, presumably. He, right, um, right no, well, actually, no, he stays in London. He stays in London doing it. He only very laterally goes around the country. So he books the Philharmonic Hall, which some people will know. Um, it's still there. It became a BBC premises um, eventually. Does a full blown program. As you can see from the bottom one, he, you can never have too many penguins. Um, and he uses them for advertising. The great and the good all come, and you can see that's a letter from Teddy Roosevelt. And then from there, um, develop his two films. And first one, as I said, The Great White Silence, full length film, it's highly praised. What he's done with, it's a combination you start going back slightly to the cinema lecture. The cinema lecture is alternating film clips and still photographs, very carefully on script that you go photograph, film clip, photograph, film clip with commentary in between, probably like David Attenborough does when he's doing a show. Um, similar process. Um, Ponting's technique on the cinema lectures, which nobody had ever done before, was so well known that it became the benchmark for Frank Hurley's Shackleton films and for John Knowles Everest films. So he goes the next stage and makes a full length film based on it. It's very much admired. He's tinted some of the film um, for atmosphere and everything. There would have been music sometimes. There might have been an orchestra, but not as it tours necessarily. Um, and then he, the next stage is, we've hit the recession, but by then Ponting's films are recognised as being something that the nation should keep. And that programme on the top right is from the version of the films that was presented to the Duke of York, who became King George, um, to keep the nation. So on the one hand, I mean, we presume there's a lot of money spinning going on, and yet there's you mentioned recession there. There's a sort of sad story yeah. that's told in the thirties, which well, which um, you know it completely upsets the sort of uh, plan that he's got in mind. Certainly, well, unfortunately, money. not a lot of money making is going on for Ponting because he's a perfectionist, and that's not necessarily a good thing to be if you want to make money. So when he comes to do his talkie version of the film, call it that, um, but this time he's working at the BBC. He's doing quite a lot of broadcasts. He's doing articles for the Radio Times. He's also working on, a, on inventions to do with the cinema, which are complete money eaters. Um, but he clearly knows there's no, no sign of letters between them as yet, unless somebody, um, unless Eric Saylor has found one yet. Um, but Ponting um, is in, certainly in contact with Walter Davis. Walter Davis, sorry, I put that wrong. Um, but he's also come into the musical world because he, um, Arthur Newman, the um, cinema, the, the camera maker he has these gatherings he and Ponting becomes friends and some of the people who attend these are musicians including members of the Corrodus family who played for the London Symphony Orchestra and he meets the lady on the right who is Gly Corrodus the niece of one of the Corroduses and he becomes they have a relationship and he sort of becomes her mentor she auditions with Tauber, doesn't, she, and Tauber. she gets a leading role on the London stage, but she's not very confident, doesn't go very far, but, but he's moved into this world. He Previously, he, I would say he's probably up to about grade four musically himself. He played the banjo in Antarctica. He was quite a dab hand and a pianola. He enjoyed choosing gramophone records. He apparently had quite a good voice. Um, so he's interested in music. Um, 
if you have a soundtrack to your film, it moves from being a silent film, which was coming out of date, and it became what they called a talkie, which is what cinema managers wanted. That's why he's done it. But when it comes out, again, as before, it's much admired and gets good reviews, but he is competing in one of the hottest summers in 1933 that Britain had had for a long time, middle of a heat wave. He's A, competing with King Kong and watching ah. people go to the pole 20 years previously in the middle of a very hot summer isn't what everybody wants to do. They perhaps would rather go to the beach. Mm. So it doesn't do proportionally as well as the previous film. But how, how has the film done uh, in, in the many decades since? Um, it, has it always been available in some form or another? Yes. Is it easily available now? Yes, you can. The, if you buy the DVD of The Great White Silence, you get the DVD of 90 Degrees South. And if I can just go to the score, um, it's actually a very... You know, I think Ponting was very involved in working out what he wanted to do in the music. Um, it was arranged and conducted by Walford Davis. I think Walford Davis got, got the musicians. He got 15 piece orchestra, which for, you know, which is quite a lot. Um, the compositions, there is some original music by Walford Davis and by Billy Tritel. You cannot tell which is which unless somebody finds the score one day. Um, but don't know where it was recorded. My guess is probably one of the concert halls. It may have been the, the, the Philharmonic Hall, or it may have been somewhere where the BBC did concerts in those days. But um, a friend and I had a really good listen through, and we found Mendelssohn's Fingal's Cave, the Naval, Naval Music Hearts of Oak, we also found what should we do with a drunken sailor and a that's, that's nothing to do with all that champagne, presumably, it was on the turn. No, that was because, interestingly, as Sarah said, this is not a naval expedition. I only learned this week that you were not allowed to sing sea shanties on a naval ship, which I hadn't known before. It bad luck or what? So because Scott ship was classified as a yacht and wasn't, the two things... One of the things it didn't have was a plimsoll line. And the thing it did have was lots of sea shanties because there were lots of merchant seamen on it. No. And the other interesting one, which I think is quite interesting in relation to the Vaughan Williams, um, Walford Davis also composed specific or arranged specific music for when the penguins, the Adeli pen, the little penguins with the lots of little penguin chicks. And he did nursery rhymes with variants of you can hear girls and boys come out to play and Baba Black Sheep for the little penguins skittering. I, I, I just love the idea of Baba Black Sheep representing the penguins. Well it's to do with no, it. I'm it's imagining this, thing. My it's mind. because it's chicks. It's because it's chicks. And talking about the value of money, the music alone cost ponting five hundred pounds and which would be um about 45,000 today, but it was also going to cost him another 2,000 to get the film finished. Oh. So uh, that takes us to the end of 90 Degrees South, and that's me for now. Uh, uh, what, just when did Ponting actually die, instead, just so that we know the end of the story? 1935, not that long after that. Ah, so it was very, yeah, so it, so it is a, a sad sort it, of ending, really. It, it was a very sad ending. The the Just to do a cheerful bit to counteract the sadness and the bankruptcy, which he was bankrupt um, by that time. The, not long before he died, he, he had heart problems for quite a long time. Not long before he died, um, he had never had a big exhibition at the Royal Photographic Society. He'd done all this other stuff. But um, they had a big travel ex exhibition and they... Um, included stuff from his entire life going away back to Japan and America and everything so he did have that before he died which was probably quite a nice vindication.
Well, Anne, that's been a wonderfully detailed account of uh, of Herbert Ponting's life, basically, pretty well beginning to end. And I'm sure that will whet people's appetite for for sampling many more of these Herbert Ponting pictures easily found on the Internet. Um, But I mean, if you can get one of the volume, big volumes of his photographs, uh, I mean, the sheer quality of the... Or, you could, or they could even buy my book and have quite a good uh, selection. Look, it, I've got it here. It's all right. It's all right, Anne. It is here. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm just completely staggered. I mean, you've opened my yeah. eyes to what a wonderful photographer he was, never mind all the filming as well. Well, look, we're going to take a, a very... Thank you so much, Anne. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. We'll take a little bit of five-minute break before we then hear from Eric and um, decided to put a little medley of, of, of music from Sinfonia Antarctica in while we're just having this little break. It slightly gets us out of sequence because we're going to be talking about the film principally next with Eric, but we'll just have some music while we just have a, a pause for pouring another glass, I should think, John Francis. So if we can have the music, that'd be great.
plants sound appropriate for the cold over here in the UK and uh, also over there in uh, uh, America. We do have somebody here from uh, Australia, so she was uh, feeling warm when she got up this morning, but uh, that uh, very shivery music uh, gets us into Vaughan Williams's music relating to Scott's turnover expedition. Um, I should say before I move on to Eric, if you want to start thinking about any questions that you might like to put at the end, we might have a little bit of time there. You can use the chat facility at the bottom of the screen there, click, or any comments you've got to make. We may not have time to, to touch on all of them, but if you have got things you'd like to say or questions you'd like to ask to anybody who's speaking this evening, please do uh, park some uh, uh, words there. So to Eric, I'm sorry you've had a long wait there, Eric. Um, uh, Not at all. It's been great to hear the other speakers today. It's been yeah. a fascinating uh, introduction to these topics. So, Eric, currently in Arizona, desperate to get back to Des Moines in Iowa, uh, where he's professor of music history at uh, Drake University. A familiar name, of course, to anybody who reads regularly about uh, British music. One of a good few uh, American scholars who have that interest. There's his 2017 book, English Pastoral Music. From Arcadia to Utopia, 1900 to 1955, uh, plus his significant uh, contribution to the sea in the British musical imagination. But most recently, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he has produced uh, a master musician's uh, biography uh, of Vaughan Williams, uh, which I actually can show that as well, Eric, if you'd like me to. You may not like me to. I oh, go right ahead. I can do it if you want it to. We we could we could do a stereo shot. Oh, look, look at that. that! Look at that! There we go. Um, so um, we're going to talk first of all and mainly about the of all members of film music here. And I'm wondering, do we know if he actually was an ardent moviegoer already in the 1930s? Uh, according to uh, Ursula von Williams, yes, he really liked uh, films a lot and and a whole wide array of things, everything from you know, the the latest, what we might think of as large scale kind of epic films down to Walt Disney cartoons. So he wasn't, um, I, I don't suppose we call him a, a terribly discerning, you know, viewer of films. He just liked a lot of stuff and, and was very happy to go and could find something to enjoy in it. So uh, I think it's just a general form of entertainment. It was definitely something that he, he gravitated toward and enjoyed quite a bit. Tended to go there with friends, would go there with dates, would go there with, uh, uh, sometimes just on his own to to enjoy an afternoon or evening out. Do I seem to remember, and uh, John Francis probably correct me if I'm wrong here, that the day that he actually met Ursula, they went to a, a cartoon presentation at, at, a, at a, a film theatre in London? So they, they did. did. Well. They did go out to film. I think I want to say, and again, John would probably correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think they that Ursula remembered that they went and saw a, uh, a Disney Silly Symphony uh or or something along those lines uh and then went out after that it was something like that i'm just trying to uh find the place in ursula's book which i just happen to have on my desk i'll i'll come back to it later that's fine well look um his first uh movie commission eric that was for muir matheson who right. we see on the screen now how, how did it basically come about what do we know uh well sort of by accident um Apparently, Vaughn Williams was speaking with one of his colleagues at the Royal College of Music, Arthur Benjamin, who was a professor of piano there, but also a composer in his own right, and you know mentioned offhandedly that he, you know, was thought that it might be interesting to go ahead and try writing for film. Benjamin was friends with Matheson, who at the time uh, was a conductor, as you can see, obviously in this slide here. He was also the music director at uh, London Films. And he and Benjamin were friends. Benjamin saw him a few days later and said, hey, I heard Vaughn Williams might be interested in doing some work for film. And so uh, Matheson, not one to waste an opportunity, apparently rang him up and said, would you like to do a film for us? Uh, so the score for a film for us. And Vaughn Williams said, yeah, sure. That sounds really interesting. How long do I have? And the response was till Wednesday, uh, which would have been about four days. Now, I think this might be a little bit exaggerated for effect for the story, but it makes for a better story. So I'm perfectly happy. Uh, to well, well, welcome to the world of movie music. But so well, we do know that it would have been a very, very short 
yeah. stretch. This yeah. was pretty common for, yeah. for these. So, so we've got uh, we've got 49th Parallel, music for 49th Parallel, Postal Command, The People's Land, uh, things like that. Um, I don't know if they're actually with us this evening, um, but uh, Shuna Rendell, who's Muir Matheson's daughter, lives just 200 metres from my home here in, in the Chilterns. And I'm hoping that she's uh, actually here uh, with us the, this evening. And uh, she lives in the self-same house where Muir, Muir Matheson lived for many, many years. And indeed, uh, uh, Shuna uh, had a sort of large Matheson archive in, in, a, in a bedroom upstairs, which is now at the British Library. So if people wish to consult the Muir Matheson archive, it's there at the British Library. Um, but it wasn't Muir Matheson who was responsible for Scott of the Antarctic music. No, that was Ernest Irving, uh, who, who was that. He was the musical director for um, Ealing Film Studios, did that for about two decades, uh, or just, just a little shy of that, from about 1935 to uh, 1953. And he was the one who commissioned Vaughn Williams to do the work for um, for that after having worked on it, on uh, an earlier film uh, with him as well. And to which Vaughn Williams by this time, if I remember correctly, I think it was, I had a lot of notes for this. They are currently sitting on a desk 1400 miles away from me. So I'm, I'm going a bit off memory here. But if I remember correctly, it was the, uh, the Loves of, jo of Joanna Godden uh, that was the film that, um, Irving first oversaw as music director in working with Vaughn Williams and was very shocked when the score came in before a single frame of film had actually been shot for the film. And yeah. um, he and Vaughn Williams uh, just, they got on like absolutely like a house on fire. Um, Irving was a very charming, very erudite, very literate man. His, his letters make for absolutely delightful reading and, for someone who likes language and jokes and things like that as much as Vaughn Williams, they just, they absolutely hit it off instantly. And so they had a very good and comfortable working relationship. You can find a lot of um, very honest comments between the two of them of what, you know, what uh, Irving says the studio wants versus what Vaughn Williams wants. And every now and then he would do things to maybe soften the blow of, of if he has to tell the composer, okay, we're going to have to make some cuts here because we can't hear the dialogue over the music that you wrote. And so one of the ones that he wrote back, I think it was in 1948, um, was this long uh, message that he wrote to him entirely in iambic tetrameter. So this this set of, I think it's about eight, eight four-line stanzas to him, perfect rhymes and so on, which, which is really charming and, and sort of softens the critique that's coming through, which which I think Vaughn Williams would have really responded to very well and, and made the changes. Well, there's a meeting of minds on the screen yeah. there now. I mean, what, what, what can we imagine a, appealed to Vaughn Williams at a fairly late stage in his life uh, in, in the idea of writing film music? Very specialist skill. No, it's a it's a great question. And I th I think and again, this is this is my current working theory when you look at what he's doing in about the mid 1930s or so after he comes out with Don Nobis Pacham uh, five Tudor portraits that that big flourishing of stuff just before the start of the the second world war he seems to to bottom out i think he was a bit burned out because he'd just been working at an absolutely crushing pace through the early 1930s and i think between the the degree of of uh, effort he was putting into his composition um i think the increasing infirmity of adeline his wife was starting to take a toll um i think the loss of holst in 1934 his closest friend one of his very few true musical intimates i think he's undergoing a bit of a crisis at this point in time and he writes to um gerald finzi among other people that he just feels dried up like he doesn't have anything left to do or to say. There are various things that help sort of revive him. One is the relationship that he begins with Ursula Wood at the time, uh, around uh, 1938. But I think also this opportunity relatively soon thereafter to go ahead and write for film was a new one too. Because again, Vaughn Williams is somebody who likes film. He loves storytelling. He loves music for the stage overall. And so the opportunity to try something new, 
right? This is a one-off thing. You have a very limited amount of time in which you have to do it. Um, you have to write, you know, X minutes of music, you know, not X plus three, not X plus 30 seconds. X is what you have to do. So I, I think that he responds really well to having really clearly defined boundaries within which he has to work and is given a certain amount of license to kind of have his own way, in part because he has enough of a reputation that he can get away with it, but also because the realm of film music is starting to change at this point in time. In the earliest days, you know, film music was seen as a little bit of, of a refuge for, for hacks and workaday musicians. And I don't necessarily mean that in a, in a derogatory sense, but it wasn't taken particularly seriously as something that a professional, you know, musician of, of art music, capital A, capital M would go ahead and pursue. But you see people like, um, uh, like William Walton, like, uh, Sergei Prokofiev and so on step into starting to write for that and it becomes clear there really is some some potential to be had and I think he likes the idea of having a fairly undefined you know palette upon which he can go ahead and and draw to create these new ideas of what he wants to do because his approach to writing film music is a bit different from what a lot of people do and I don't know if you had that as something you wanted to to bring up a bit later. Uh, uh, and well, I mean, one one, th one thing that interests me is he quite clearly wasn't going to simply respond to images that were put in front of him or look at, looking at, at at clips and what have you. He gets very involved in the Scott story, and in fact, we referred earlier to actually Cherry Garrard's book. Mm -hmm. We know that he got got very engaged by that. Oh, very much so. And and the, the the quality you were describing just a second ago, that notion of, you know, he you're you're absolutely right in saying he wasn't going to respond to a director saying, okay, here's a 30 second stretch that we need. Here's what's going to happen. Here are the film rushes. You can see what's going on. Now we need you to synchronize your music to that so that when there's somebody slipping on the ice and falls down, you hear a whoops kind of noise or something like that. He wasn't interested in that at all. Um, that's a technique that's often known as Mickey Mousing. And and if you're familiar with, you know, old Disney cartoons or uh, the, the old Warner Brothers Looney Tunes cartoons, those were wonderful at, at synchronizing image and sound in, in that precise kind of manner. What Vaughn Williams did instead was would he would be given a general description of what the the scene was or what was going to be going on at a particular point in time. And then he would just imagine you know, what the music would be for that. And he would write a scenario of however many seconds or minutes long uh, was needed for that. And then the film, uh, the, sorry, the music director would then take that, put it up against the rushes that were in, and then realize, oh, okay, now that these have been edited down, we actually have five seconds uh, too, too little of music. We need to have a little bit more, or it's a bit too long. We can make these decisions to cut, and they would go back and forth with some kind of descriptions of. But, but of was how was that he worked. able to, to to do it absolutely instantly on demand? Uh, was he you know, at the studios? Is that something you could actually do technically? Uh, he could actually. He he thought that it was a great technique. He would tell. He he had a, a little anecdote that said, "What you do is is if you get something like that, said, oh, the sound isn't quite right, or now we've got this the scene where." You know, uh, there's there's light that's glimmering off the water and the music just, you know, it doesn't work for that. And he said, all right, well, what you do then is tell all the musicians to go, you know, have a smoke break for five minutes and everybody's always happy to do that. And then you sit down and you go, all right, well, we could put a heart glissando in here and we'll add a little bit for piccolo there. And oh, look, now we've got sun glinting off water, job done. Um, so it was something that he um could do pretty quickly. And he encouraged it very, very strongly as a technique for uh, student musicians. And I think he he was in writing this, thinking back to his own youth in which he struggled and suffered over a huge amount of, of the work that he wrote. And it often took him quite a bit of time to, to do. And um, he said, this, these are great, this, this is a great discipline for students who are likely to be dawdling in their work or for, for whom every idea is sacred and can't possibly be touched. You have to, 
you have to learn how to edit. You have to learn how to go ahead and make these kinds of changes to strengthen what the music is going to do, because it's very clear he was thinking of this in a Wagnerian kind of sense, um, in, in that he, he saw film as being a way of uniting all of the arts of drama and storytelling and image and music and movement in in a in a kind of you know 20th century Gesamtkunstwerk. And he he even said as much that he he thought film provided opportunities that um, Wagner never even would have dreamed of. Mm -hmm. It's maybe a little ironic that his actual approach then is maybe a bit more like we would have seen from somebody like Tchaikovsky or other people who compose for ballet. Right, and that you're told here's the scenario, and then you have to work with the choreographer to go ahead and make those kinds of changes sometimes on the fly uh, to go ahead and and recast it. So he gets a royal command performance, as we can see from the advert here, uh, late November 1948, and then uh, which he begged off of attending. Uh, he he Ernest Sterling said that he was obviously very much desired to go, and he said I could I I can't possibly I don't want to have anything to do with that too much pressure. To go ahead really? and tender yeah really that's interesting yeah. and then it went on on general release uh, a few days uh, after that uh, early december 1948 well look um we can talk about this forever i'm absolutely fascinated by this um uh, unfortunately we can't get the screen synchronized uh, on zoom with the music so i'll just run you through the different tracks that we're going to be listening to quickly now um i, I don't know if you want to comment on it, any of these there's the, the ship's departure from Cardiff, these are these are titles of the, the tracks uh, with a very familiar tune. Will you know? Come back again, um, and then Aurora. Um, uh, I don't know if you've got anything you want to say about uh, Aurora. It's Southern Lights yeah. is what, what it's sort of representing. Yeah, there's a couple of these. Um, the the tracks that are taken from this. What's important to understand is that when this is commissioned there's some 30 odd different bits that he has to write. And so they have these working titles and so on. And this is all done, you know, in, in 1948. And what's really striking is that, of course, for many of you here, you know that the music from Scott was later mined for Sinfonia Antarctica. And it's a very interesting comparison, even just casually listening uh, of, of what you hear in one versus the other. So Aurora is a great... Uh, example of this. When you listen to it, you could hear sort of a combination of musical effects, particularly in the realm of orchestration, that's present in the first, second, and third movements of uh, Sinfonia Antarctica later. And the one that really stands out to me is that sort of glittering magic fire quality that you especially hear in the first two uh, movements. Um, it's even more pronounced here. I mean, it seems almost like a like he's looking into his old um you know uh, score of uh valkyra and going Ooh, I can, I, i'm in a real hurry we'll just take a bit of this and throw that in it yeah. it sounds very very close to that source material uh, so we got a blizzard which is fairly self-explanatory i'm not quite sure exactly what the march is is actually doing uh at that point in the story as it as, as the situation gets darker and, and darker uh, black flag. I think I've been put right on exactly what the black flag. This particular black flag. What well, this 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 is this is Amundsen's black flag that they come. Mm -hmm. Apologies for that. And then the return, and then the discovery of, of of the tent and bodies. Well, John, if we could actually have this this uh, selection from the film, not not all of of this. I don't think appeared actually did appear in the film. I think that's the the thing about Martin Yates's selection. Uh, but we won't go into all the detail of that. Please, John.
I think that was all the music, Andrew. Um, yeah. Just confirming, I put it in the chat, that it was indeed a Disney City Symphony. Thank you, Eric, well remembered. Um, some people have not been able to hear the music. I'm sorry about that. I think more of you could hear the music coming through. I've no idea what that would be. I'll do some Googling on it later. Thanks very much indeed, John. That's great. So that was the Royal Scottish National Orchestra and uh, the women of the uh, Royal Scottish National Orchestra Chorus, uh, conducted by Martin Yates. Uh, that's available on the Dutton Epoch label. And of course, it was Martin Yates who did all the amazing work in pulling together the complete score of Scott of the Antarctic. And Lewis Foreman, who is here with the centre of my screen, was very much involved in that project as a consultant. In an ideal world, Lewis, I would talk to you for 10 minutes now. But I fear we don't have 10 minutes. But a fantastic job that you did. We congratulate you and Martin, who um, likewise we should be uh, talking to about that. But if we very swiftly, Eric, move on to the way in which the score we've just been hearing, as it were, transmutes into Sinfonia Antarctica. Antarctica. How, how can one describe that process? It's it's quite a complex process, isn't it? It's not a matter of it just listing stuff and putting it into a, a different order. Yeah. He had already tried to do a bit of this with um, uh, music from the Flemish Farm, which was a slightly earlier film that he had done and turned it into a suite. Again, it's it's not unlike ballet again. Copeland did this all the time. He would have music for a ballet and then excerpt numbers for it to put together into a suite-like organization. And I think that's sort of how Vaughn Williams is, is thinking about this. And for those of you who know Sinfonia Antarctica well, you undoubtedly picked out bits and bobs just even in that short sampling that uh, John played for us that you could hear, oh yes, that comes out of landscape or oh, that comes out of the Penguins movement or whatever it might be. Um, but it's also not exactly the same. There's that great bit in um, uh, in the number 101 March, for instance, where you hear what sounds like is supposed to be the Antarctic, the main theme from the first movement of Sinfonia Antarctica, but now it's in uh, a major key rather than in minor. So it's a very different kind of quality. So I'm, I am uh, sort of assuming that part of the reason why there's that change is because that major quality gives it sort of a triumphal sound. But as uh, as Andrew alluded to earlier, Vaughn Williams got increasingly angry about what he saw as the fecklessness of the campaign, about the risks that were taken that should not have been, like uh, more people traveling on rations than should have, for example. Um, and, and I think he got increasingly angry with Scott's management of the trip. And so, that changing it to minor gives it more of that tragic overtone, I think. And there's no reference to it a major at all in Sinfonia Antarctica, where of course there was in the film, you need to have that triumphant happy ending. And I don't think Von Williams believed in that one bit. So when he got it, his hands on the opportunity to create the version he wanted, that got left out. It's those kinds of changes that you can hear. And as, as was noted, not every bit gets used. Uh, and there's some new bits that are put together and different parts are taken from different um, sections in the film, stitched together and then expanded, transformed, new bits added, other bits taken out completely. I The, the process itself is, is a fairly complex one and it meant that reception was somewhat mixed. Some people thought it was a really wonderful reimagining of the music for the film in this new manner designed for uh, for Symphonic Hall. Other people, I think, just thought it was tacky. Uh, I think there's there's a certain kind of critic who thinks that having a symphony based on film music is um, unseemly. You've got low art and high art combining and, and don't like that. So you find some really mixed reviews of, of the premiere of uh, Sinfonia Antarctica with a quite a bit of, of sort of um, upturned noses from some critics at it who just don't, you know, there's, there's these very, very tedious discussions of whether or not it's a real symphony or not, which I tend to just sort of gloss over. We don't really have that sort of baggage today I don't think, but it was a very, very real uh, concern at the height of high modernism at the middle of the 20th century. Well, it's, it's very interesting you you say that about the the, the reaction. Um, I interviewed the 
Vormalium Society AGM a few months ago, uh, Sir Mark Elder, and we talked mm. across the, the gamut of Vormalium's symphonies and, and other pieces. And, and he said the one piece that he found it difficult, most difficult to conduct was Sinfonia Antarctica. And I think John will correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. He said something like, I don't know quite what to do with it. And I don't know if that chimes with you at all or whether you would understand exactly what he means by that. I think so. I mean, it's a for start, it's a big, big piece. There's a lot of instruments. And and for those of you who only know it by recording, you you sort of intuit this. But I had a chance this summer to actually see a performance of it live at the Bard Festival in upstate New York. And I I was absolutely taken aback by just how vast the resources are on there. And I think maybe a sense of control with that is tricky. It doesn't always hang together in terms of a consistent sound uh, all the way through. Some movements emphasize one quality, others emphasize another entirely from a purely timbral perspective. Um, there are some fairly stark changes from one movement to the next, but I don't, again, this is just a personal uh, response on my part. I don't really understand when people say things like it doesn't hang all together because there are ideas that come back. They don't, it's not necessarily being done in a Beethovenian sense where there's this absolutely rigid internal logic that connects the whole thing, but it's more of a suite. It's like, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. We're going to tie it up here at the end to make sure you know that the whole thing is in fact connected. So well, it is a episodic than than some of his symphonies yeah. are that well, might be what a lot of people at. would just say to hell with all that there's just some wonderful music in that that's and it, that's yeah. what matters to me i will different different strokes for different rush folks. These, we'll just rush the, these images his his born williams there watching john barbaroli conduct uh, a rehearsal of the halle um there's an image of roy douglas who of course was huge help to vaughan williams in in uh, developing later works actually getting them down on paper correcting them and all the rest who died not all that long ago mm -hmm. um and for, uh, is that right that this is Vaughan williams actually conducting a rehearsal of it i think that's that, i that's, think it is yeah yeah so he did actually have have a job actually rehearsing some of symphonia in antarctica and then we move on to the actual premiere uh, up in Manchester, and there's uh, Peter Scott, which many of us, who many many of us remember from wildlife programs on the television over here. But of course, Scott's uh, son, uh, and then the reception after the premiere uh, in in 1953, and uh, charmingly afterwards, Vaughan Williams making a speech with uh, Irvin just to his left there. Eric, that's been absolutely wonderful we must move on we must hear from from kirsten because there's a a, a a a nice little sort of tick at the end of this story as we move on to to peter maxwell davis's symphony number number eight and kirsten who i can't see on the screen at the moment perhaps i ought just to stop screen sharing so that i can locate her uh where are you kirsten there you are you're up there. So Kirsten is currently working on 20th century uh, music reflecting the Antarctic at the University of Illinois, uh, where she is at the moment. Uh, pretty cold there as well, uh, Kirsten, we were saying. We've got snow on the ground. We do have snow on the ground, um, which I'd like to think helps it make it feel warmer, but I'm not actually sure if that's true yeah. in these awful so temperatures. <laughs> But uh, as I say, one particular area of research, as far as you're concerned, is into uh, Peter Maxwell Davis's Symphony uh, Number no. Eight, which is often called, I don't know exactly how far it was intended to be called, his Antarctic Symphony. And how, how did he actually come to be asked to write a symphony about the Antarctic? It wasn't simply his idea at all, was it? No. And so it was actually subtitled Antarctic Symphony and is often just referred to as Antarctic Symphony. The whole number eight thing, people just leave off um, all the time. <laughs> but he, it wasn't his idea at all. The British Antarctic Survey, um, which located in Cambridge and heads up all of the UK's polar endeavors in both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, um, 
in 1995, a visit to their Antarctic stations by Princess Anne was canceled. And so they were really wanting something that would provide good publicity. And one of their PR officers suggested commissioning a symphony to commemorate the film Scott of the Antarctic and Symphonia Antarctica. And so this PR officer, Linton McLean, um, he went to the Philharmonia Orchestra and asked them for a recommendation of who to commission and if they thought it was a good project. They recommended Peter Maxwell Davies and it just kind of spiraled from there into a 40 minute long symphony, 45 minutes, depending on how slow the conductor chooses to take sections of it. Yeah, well, look, he, he was an absolutely appropriate person to write such a work, wasn't he? He really was. He was actually at the 1953 Manchester premiere of Sinfonia Antarctica. Um, the British Antarctic Survey got a hold of a program for him, sent him a Xerox copy so that he could kind of relive the experience of being at the premiere. Um, and as a way of negotiating his fee down, they emphasized to him, like, this is really commemorating the Vaughn Williams. You really like Vaughn Williams. You get to go to Antarctica. This is a once in a lifetime experience that most people will never get. And it was successful and managed to get into their budget. So I, I understand these are actually images that relate to the, the, the trip that Max took I think I think I'm right in saying that so these aren't just general yes. pictures they sent a cameraman down with him which the the cameraman Pete Buck Trout was already going to be there as part of other work um but while Davies was down there they had Pete Buck Trout film him in an attempt to create a documentary that never panned out and also to take all kinds of PR images that they could then publicize. Um, a lot of them are included in the published versions of Davis's diary um, called Notes from a Cold Climate. If, if you're interested in seeing more of them. Yeah, absolutely. But you, 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 in passing, you, you mentioned his feeling for the music of, of, of Vaughan Williams. I mean, it wasn't just that Symphonia Antarctica premiere. Uh, he just did get Vaughan Williams symphonies in particular, I think. He must have conducted various of them. Uh, is that right? I, I would assume that he's conducted some of them, but I'm not positive on that. Um, the plan for the premiere of Davis's symphony was actually for it to start with Sinfonia Antarctica and end with the new symphony, with Davis conducting both things. Um, that didn't pan out. Unfortunately, that would have been a, a great program. Well, we, uh, John, if we could possibly have what I think um, you'll find is described as Max One. Um, this is from from near the start of the symphony. I think I'm right in saying this: that you're, you're you're sort of hearing the the ship going through the ice. At least that's that's the impression I sort of got at, at, at the front. And if we have the, this clip, you'll be able to hear that. Please, John.
thank you, John. Um, extraordinary. Let me just make sure I can get back into the, the screen share. There we go. Extraordinary range of instruments, Kirsten, in this, and I think I think I might have. Yes. Um, here's here's the percussion section. Um, I'll give people a, a moment just to read read that through. Um, and I think we were supposed to hear the biscuit tin filled with broken glass at that point. Yeah, some of them are a bit difficult to pick out unless you're watching it in the score as you're listening to it. It just goes by so quickly. My personal favorite is the two small pebbles. <laughs> It's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, this is a question that I could have asked, uh, obviously, as far as Paul Williams is, is concerned, but what are the means by which, why does this music seem to represent the cold and the landscape? What are the essential elements that you have to try and put across and how, how do you do that in compositional terms? I think the use of all of these different percussion instruments really, they all lend themselves well to the different ice sounds. But I mean, a symphony can't just be percussion. So all of these different intervals where you hear wide spacings and chords and lots of higher timbres, higher, higher registers, um, you've got the flutes and the violins and they're creating these shimmery kind of effects that really is really kind of very effective. Yeah. Did he actually acknowledge a debt to Sinfonia Antarctica in the, the actual writing of this piece? Not that I've found so far. Um, he did do a lot of radio interviews that I have not been able to find archival sources for that I would love to hear. I'm sure somebody asked him that and it just didn't get saved in the early internet if 2000 was really early for the internet. Well, what I find fascinating is that before he wrote this, he was virtually saying goodbye to the symphony. He'd virtually said, I'm not gonna do any more symphonies, but this is something that in, inspired him to, to actually uh, renounce that. Yeah, and it also inspired him to write um, at least two other pieces of music inspired by Antarctica. Um, there's his High on the Slopes of Terror from 1999 and Port Lockroy, which is a Antarctic research base. Sorry, not research base. It's an Antarctic base that at one point was used for research. Now it's a kind of a tourist stop in an Antarctic heritage site. Um, but all of his experiences in Antarctica kind of really inspired him with both Antarctic music and then revisiting the symphony again. So how was it received when it when it was was first performed? It was received really well. Um, some reviewers were comparing its scale to Sibelius and others were comparing the sounds to the ones that Vaughn Williams chose to use for Symphonia Antarctica. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on really the way that he portrayed time through all of the different tempos that he used. It's At some points, it's a little bit of a whiplash because you go from a really slow tempo to a really quick tempo. And he used that to represent the different time scales that are present in Antarctica because humans exist at a different form of time than the ice sheets and the microorganisms and the whales, which have much longer lifespans and slower metabolisms. It's interesting that apart from Scott of the Antarctic, there's also a, a, a DVD I've got somewhere in my collection. I think New Zealand company uh, made a, 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 a film of um, the Antarctic landscape with the complete Vaughan Williams score underneath it. And it's an absolutely magical thing. And I wonder if this score, the Max score, would be even more magical 
if you actually did have the visual images, I wonder how important visual images might might be. Yes. So I know for the 2005 staging of this as part of, um, it was kind of a festival to celebrate Max. Um, there was a film made that accompanied the symphony on stage. And I would love to see that. I haven't found it. <laughs> um, if anybody has a copy of it that they secretly filmed in the concert, I won't tell anybody. I'd love to see that. But, but you know, you need, to, really you need well to marry received. the two. Yeah. Well, look, let's round things off by just having a, 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 another clip from the Max Symphony, which really, really shivery uh, sense you get from this as, as he explores deeper into, into, into the Antarctic on this magical trip that he actually made. John, if we could possibly have the second Max clip and then we're done. So there we are. Um, I don't think you'll find that simply on Spotify, for example, but I think you can find it just as a YouTube. Um, uh, so that's something to look out for. Kirsten, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure uh, to have you along this evening. We wish your continuing research into Antarctic music uh, well. Uh, big job, I would have said. There must be lots of stuff out there. Or perhaps you'll tell me there's not quite so much out there. But it's great to have you with us and enjoy your snow. Um, so thank you for people who've uh, to people who've actually uh, been posing questions on the chat. Um, the ones I've seen so far are directed look like look like they're directed towards you, uh, Eric. Uh, for example, Adrian Holmes got in pretty quickly to say, "Is it fair to say that Vaughan Williams created the music, uh, the original film music, I presume, in a symphonic context?" So the Sinfonia Antarctica is a better represent representation of what he was doing than the film score. Can you make something of that? Well, you, you don't ask the easy ones. Um, it's not me, it's Adrian. No, I, I know. I mean, it's uh, it's difficult to say because I, I think he's conceiving them as two different things because they serve two different purposes, right? One, the you know, as much as he would have preferred otherwise, the music is... Um, you know, part of the larger uh, artistic creation that's going on. And however much it might have pained him to admit it, he knows that people aren't necessarily going to the movies to listen to the music. I mean, that's not why any normal person does that. So it's it's part of a whole and it has to be written in a way that can do it. Now, if, you're, if you think about the notion of is Vaughn Williams so taken by what he's writing for that situation, that it fires his imagination in a manner that he might not have been expecting and wanted to go back to it and, and treat it in new ways. I think that's very possible. And he, 
Um, he did this, as I said, with the music from Flemish Farm. He wanted to, um, he usually retained the right to go ahead and take his music back so that he could do whatever he wanted to with it afterwards. In, in, and in some cases he did. And I think just more than almost any other film, this was one where he he felt like he could put this on the scale that the story demanded in a purely sonic context, detached from films and, and, and so on. Although it still doesn't explain why he bothered to go ahead and put the little um, epigraphs at the start of each movement, because that was something entirely divorced from the film as well. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's quite right to say, you know, Sinfonia Antarctica is a better version than Scott of the Antarctic because they're, they're, they're just two different things for two different purposes. Um, uh, Anne, I see you posted a question to Kirsten about the connections between, uh, between, uh, 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 the Orkneys, where where Max, of course, lived for very many years, yes. uh, yeah. and uh, I don't know if you want to put a question your, your, yourself. Yeah, I mean, or Orkney, Orkneys is in completely linked into Arctic history. Everybody stopped their ships in the way to to water the ships in the way to the Arctic. You feel very, very close to the Arctic, so it wouldn't have been so strange to him as it would have been to Von Williams. But the other thing I wanted to ask generally to do with that is um, some of those pictures are put up of Ponting's abstract pictures. The first time I heard Symphony Antarctica, it felt like a, a abstract painting compared to a figurative painting, which is the film music. And I think the visual imagery of that, he's freed from having to do any narrative. And it's like some of those ones I showed of Ponting and camera artists, which are just expanses of snow. Whereas Maxwell Davis is actually quite figurative because a lot of the crashing, that's a ship going through the ice. That's an icebreaker going through the ice that he's been on. So it's a much more first hand rather than the sublime nature thing, which I think the Symphony Antarctica, Ron Williams one is. Makes Sorry, sense to you, Justin, yeah. Impressions. Yes, most most definitely. Um, and Davies actually picked up some fossils to help inspire him when he left Antarctica and remind him of his experiences there as well while he was composing back in Orkney. I like the comment from Paul, is it Sarkic? Re referring to the metal, the, the sound of metal being bashed is a very cold sound. It's a, that's a, that's a, a, an interesting thought. Um, any other questions that people would like to to put to anybody before we close? Uh, Eric, you're putting, oh, or is that John putting a hand up? Yeah, well, yeah, same, same Eric, here. Eric, go ahead, yeah. Just to ask Sarah very quickly, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about this graphic novel that you've put Ooh. together. What was your contribution to it? Were you the uh, the writer, the illustrator, both? How did how did you come up with the idea to go ahead and put something like this together? I am the mad woman who's doing everything. Um, oh, that's bad. I heard a I heard a radio play on Radio Four. Thank you, Radio Four. Um, and it I I knew like the bare bones of the Scott story before, but the radio play really it introduced me to the people, and the people are what are amazing about the story. And I thought everyone needs to know about this. And there hadn't been a retelling of it for since the eighties, basically. And I thought we we need this story now. So yeah, I can I can. Everyone else has been holding up their book. Where's Please my do. Book? Uh, I, I was feeling so, I was feeling guilty about that, Sarah. That I didn't yes, go so, so it's it's basically it's just a big comic book. Um, telling the story of the expedition, oh, but it's, it's also must got have. factual, that is a must factual have. notes at the end. So I'll have to get. If that. you want further further factual details on what you read in the comic, they're all at the back. Thank you for that. Can, can I I'll give a, to... Can I give a product endorsement? It's really great and really worth it. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. And I'll, I'll who, do a plug for the, plug uh, the book this evening. I'll do a plug for the polar research. I'll do a plug for the polar research center too. Uh, I visited there a few years ago. It's absolutely tremendous. Mm. Really, really loved it. So if you're in Cambridge, it's very much worth a visit. Right by the Fitzwilliam. Same. So, Well, there's just one one final question. We we, we ought to stop. And look at that. It's exactly 9.30. Um, 
Uh, do we know if Vaughan Williams, Eric, was actually happy with the Finnish symphony? As far as he was ever happy with anything that he did, yes. <laughs> um, so that's that's about as, as far as I'm willing to go. Yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating evening, uh, and it's great to have had a, a, a large uh, live audience. I don't know what the figures were on YouTube, but we've had a, a, a really decent... Uh, yeah. Oops. I've, I've shared the wrong screen. I'm desperately trying to share it's a already, YouTube audience. It's already on a graph, you mean? The... It doesn't want to do that, does it? It really doesn't. It's... Um... It doesn't want to do it, but the but well, it's it's not quite but in the, the non-live. Uh, but I can tell you that the not live audience is in is in the region of twenty two to twenty three, and they and they've stayed loyal to the show for two hours. Well, so uh, thank you, YouTubers, um, as you're here in about thirty seconds' time. Yeah, well, I mustn't forget to thank you, John, for for doing the tech stuff this evening. <laughs> really, very very grateful. It's really important that. You know, we can all rely on somebody at the controls. And thank you very much for what you've done. And I can't thank the four guests enough. They put a lot of thought in, into repairing for this. We've had numerous emails backwards and forwards. Um, thank you for the trouble that you've taken. Uh, uh, these events of this sort are, are always sort of like bleeding chunks. They're not the whole story by any means. We have to cut into the story in particular ways. And in some ways, it leaves it very unsatisfying. But the wealth of detail that we've actually unearthed this evening in one way or the other, even without hearing from Lewis. I'm so sorry, Lewis, but we, we must bring you in on, on a future occasion. So thanks to uh, Sarah, to Anne, to Eric and to Kirsten. Uh, great to have the pleasure of meeting you. And I hope we don't just say cheerio and never meet again. Let's hope that there are reasons for us to meet. Um, there will be another Vaughan Williams Society evening of this sort. I don't know what it'll be, but in, in midsummer, look out for news of that. And meanwhile, there are, for example, monthly interviews being plonked somewhere on social media or YouTube uh, uh, with all sorts of people uh, who have connections to performing uh, Vaughan Williams and other ways of inter interfacing with it. And uh, they're uh, uh, available on the internet. Now, look out for those. So thank you so much to all of you for coming and uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye for now and thank you. Cheerio.